And it came to pass, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now we must address the big question. Who are the sons of God? Because whoever they are, their children become giants. Of course, there are two main theories. One theory is that the sons of God were disobedient angels that came down to earth and took human wives. The other theory is that they were ordinary men, but they were nice and well-behaved gentlemen. Over the years, people have given that group a name. They call them the sons of Seth. The story continues. They say that what the Bible calls the daughters of men is really the female descendants of Cain. And those sons of Seth, unfortunately, found the daughters of Cain to be so tempting that they couldn't resist them. Are we to assume that Seth's great-granddaughters are so ugly that they couldn't compete with Cain's great-granddaughters? They think that the daughters of Cain kept turning out Betty and Veronica's all the time, while Seth's own granddaughters were the equivalent of Big Ethel. But let's go with their theory and see how it plays out. So according to this human theory, where the sons of Seth are called the sons of God, these boys are sweet, kind, and godly sons of Seth. They are the good guys. But their females aren't pretty, and by comparison, the sons of Seth find the daughters of Cain to be very attractive. And they take them for wives instead of the Seth daughters, who only have, well, you know, nice personalities. And somehow their children turn into giants. In comparison, the angel theory has the sons of God angels like they are referred to in the book of Job. The angels find the daughters of men to be attractive, and after seeing them, they take on physical form and mate with the daughters of men. This coming together produced giants, and these giants were well known, and many stories would be told about their abilities. The giants are referred to as mighty men, and men of renown. Men of renown means that the people all over heard about what these giants did, and what they were capable of. The problem with the angel theory is... Well, it's shocking. And some people don't like to be shocked. It upsets their general attitudes and positive thinking. But we're still not done with the Sons of Seth theory. To address this theory called the Sons of Seth, let us take a closer look at their sons. Someone tries to call them the Sons of God, but we know these descendants all have human fathers. When the Gospel of Luke traces back the genealogy in Luke chapter 3, he names the sons of Seth and names each father. Is Enos a son of God? No. According to the Bible, he's the son of Seth. Is Canaan a son of God? No. According to the Bible, he's the son of Enos. Is Malaleel a son of God? No. According to the Bible, he's the son of Canaan. These men have human fathers. Now at this point, you'll accuse me of being a nitpicker or I'm too technical. You'll say that the designation sons of God is a spiritual moniker and not a physical one. They tell us those sons of Seth were the Old Testament equivalent to being New Testament Christians, making them the original good old boys. Because of how shocking the alternative angel theory was, as a younger man, I also rejected it and went with the good old boys theory, the sons of Seth theory. Until one day I was struck with the nagging question of how can a good guy, having children with an ungodly woman, produce a giant? Many times I would see a good Christian man who ended up marrying a wife and that wife would over time become very worldly and would run around and be downright mean and evil. And yet they had children, all under six feet tall. If a good Christian man, quote, son of God today, is capable of having children with some daughters of men, then let's face it, we'd be overrun with giants here in the 21st century. But that's not happening now, is it? So let's take a look at the angel theory. Angels were created beings, so they don't have any human fathers. Therefore, by default, they are indeed sons of God. 
They are mentioned in the book of Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. In the book of Job, God asks a series of questions that Job can't answer. And he talks about the creation of earth. And he tells us in chapter 38, when the morning star sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Comparing scripture with scripture, we find in 2 Peter 2.4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So here we have a verse telling us that a group of angels sinned. So what happened to these bad angels? In the book of Jude, it tells us, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. All of these verses seem to back up the angel theory as to how these giants got here. But I sense that you are about to give the old excuse about angels being only spirit beings and not able to get married. You'll have us turn to a passage in Matthew for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And then you'll refer us to the companion verse found in Mark 12. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. But did you notice that clarifier? Those are the angels that remained in heaven. They don't marry. The book of Jude and 2 Peter told you that there's a group of angels down in hell that are chained up. So there's two groups, and you need to be certain as to which group you are talking about. Now, to help you realize that the angel theory is the correct way to interpret Genesis chapter 6, you can't help but notice that every time an angel makes an appearance on earth, he is always mistaken for a man. In Judges chapter 13, an angel appears to a woman. This woman is going to be the mother of Samson. And the angel tells her that she's going to have a son. So what did the woman do when she heard this good news? Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, An angel. No, 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 she didn't say that. She didn't say angel. She described him as a man who had the countenance of an angel. So we see that angels look like men, even though you're looking right at them and can kind of tell they are a special kind of man. But this continues. Now the husband prays to God. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man. Notice how the angel keeps getting referred to as a man. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. Now, this next verse is the most important of the whole narrative. So far, it's been the husband and the wife mistaking this angel for a man. But note how the Bible now refers to the angel. Verse 11, And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man. Stop right there. What did the Bible just call the angel? This is no longer he said and then she said, now the Bible itself says they came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? I wonder what this angel is going to say to that question, Art thou the man? And he said, I am. I realize that for those of you that already accept this, this kind of study can be very frustrating. You believe the Bible where it says something and you take it for what it says. But we must be patient with our fellow brethren that are still having a difficult time in accepting this. Now, I gently remind our brethren that this sort of thing should not be shocking, as we've always had this verse. What is man, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now those verses tell us that mankind was made a little lower than the angels, which makes sense as one time an angel killed 185,000 men 
in a single night. Now, I don't know how often you've tried to kill 185,000 men in a single night, but you would have to be very fast. I'm not a mathematician, but with about 10 hours of darkness to work with, you've got to be stabbing about, I guess, two men per second. And that's hoping that they are lined up in neat little rows. I don't know about you, but my arms would probably wear out after the first couple of thousand. So the angels are indeed superior to us in many ways, but we are similar. That doesn't mean that angels are a couple of feet taller than men. That verse was referring to their power and ability. So how do we explain their offspring becoming giants? Well, the angels probably had all kinds of superior knowledge and they knew how to get things done. If I were to hazard a guess, I wouldn't be surprised if it had something to do with blood. After all, we were told time and time again not to drink blood. Not that drinking blood makes your children grow tall. There's probably something more to it than that, but I don't have to speculate on how the devil's crowd gets things done. Instead, I'll really give you conversational whiplash and talk about lions and tigers. For many years, people have speculated as to who would win in a fight between a lion and a tiger. The lion is taller, but the tiger has more mass. And we're not going to solve that riddle today. Instead, we merely note that when a male and female tiger get together, that their offspring grow up to be a standard height. And then they stop growing. Something in the DNA of the tigers gets passed on to the tiger cub that tells the tiger to stop. But what if you could replace the male tiger? Instead of a male tiger, let's arrange a marriage of a male lion and a female tiger. We can do this because lions and tigers and leopards are in the same family of big cats and they can reproduce. Just like mankind is made a little lower than the angels. Do you see where I'm going with all of this? If we replace the human father with an angel, then the DNA will be different and perhaps it won't have those certain indicators to tell the offspring to stop growing. Discover Magazine had an article that said, genetically speaking, you are more like your father. And sure enough, when we replace the normal tiger father with a lion father, we get huge offspring. This animal is called a liger, and the liger is bigger than its parents. To get an idea of just how big this creature is, the woman in the photo is holding a tiger cub. The father lion weighs about 420 pounds, but the offspring weighs double that, between 800 and 900 pounds. Their heads can grow to be two and a half times larger than their parents. So we have an example in observable science of how something like this can happen. That's not to say that the angels didn't use blood or experiment on the women, and this is where we probably get all of those old stories about vampires and strange men that prey upon females. But even stranger than what happened in Genesis 6 is yet to happen in our near future. In Daniel chapter 2, we find a strange verse that perhaps you've read many times but never stopped long enough to think it over. Of course, you know that Daniel was revealing the future to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, and each part of the tall idol represented a future kingdom. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. This image's head was of fine gold, and his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet of iron and part of clay. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Did you see the word they? Who is they? If they aren't human, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. To cleave to one another is another way of saying to get married. So that will be different than what happened in Genesis 6. The angels cleaved unto women, but this time, whoever the they is, they won't cleave to the seed of men, just be mingled with it. And since it tells us about iron and clay, and how weird this union is going to be, we have to acknowledge that mankind is the clay. 
But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay. And wilt thou bring me into dust again? This verse uses clay and dust. It seems like that word dust is familiar. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So if mankind is the clay, some group of individuals wants to mingle iron into us, or more technically, into our DNA, instead of cleaving to the seed of men. Perhaps this sort of thing happens in laboratories, all in the name of wanting to live forever in our current sinful condition. Now, I'm not making this video to be overly dramatic, nor do I want it to cause you any panic. As a Bible believer, I'm not worried about any of this for myself. I am worried about the future of humanity, though, as this verse is a clear warning. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And one needs to ask yourself, what was going on in the days of Noah? It's good for us to know about these things, and any true student of the Bible should be aware of them, but concentrating too much on these topics can give us an improper balance. There are entire ministries that talk about nothing but this kind of stuff, and it's good that they exist, but I don't want to end this video with what the devil's crowd is up to. So I'll leave you with this word. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. As a Christian, that's what I'm waiting to see. I'm waiting for Jesus, and I hope you are as well.